So, dear participants, we are starting the next session, the last one. Uh, the last one, thematic case studies session, is uh, dedicated to living religious and sacred world heritage in a historic urban context. It will be moderated by Mrs. Manana Vardzelashvili, head of UNESCO and International Relations Unit, nation, uh, nation of the National Agency for Cultural Heritage Preservation of Georgia, focal point for World Heritage Convention. So uh, the floor is yours, Mrs. Vardzelashvili. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to express my uh, great sincere gratitude and uh, appreciation to the organizers. Uh, of this very, uh, very benefited and very uh, interesting uh, international uh, venue, international meeting for creating this uh, very uh, harmonious and beneficial platform for all of us to continue discussion, a timely discussion of the current issues related to the living religious world heritage. Started here in Kiev in 2010 to ensure the outstanding universal values through the participatory management and sustainable use of these sites. For us, these discussions are very constructive and helpful to listen and share with your experiences how to harmonize the religious needs with world heritage demands to the heritage properties in other countries. I would like also to express my deepest appreciation to Christopher Young, who will attend us later, as I understand, for his very uh, constructive leadership in this, um, to, to in organizing uh, of the seminar and uh, helping us to reach the main goals of the uh, meeting. Within the uh, session, uh, the fourth thematic session, uh, fourth thematic session, four presentations should be introduced, including mine, uh, focusing on the living religions and sacred world heritage in a historical urban context that is most complicated and multi-sectoral task for all state parties, I propose. In my pres presentation, I would like to share with the current most crucial challenges that we have towards in the management of religious sites in Georgia, and to say true, I have much more open questions than the solutions and answers. Uh, my case study uh, will attach the current issues of the Tsheta World Heritage Site. Uh, the historical monuments, please, present that to me. The historical monuments of Tzcheta are located in the cultural landscape of the confluence of Aragui and Tkwari rivers in central eastern part of Georgia, very close to the capital of the country. The World Heritage property consists of the Jwari Monastery, Svetitschoveli Cathedral, and some Tower Monastery. Tzcheta was the ancient capital of Kartli, the eastern Georgian kingdom from 3rd century before Christ to 5th century AD and was also the location where Christianity was adopted as the state religion in Georgia in 388, sorry. To date, it still remains the spiritual center of the country and the holy capital of Georgia as it's, it is proclaimed by the Georgian Apostolic Orthodox Church. The favorable natural conditions, its strategic location in the center of intersection of trade routes and its close relations with the Roman and Persian empires, Syria, Palestine, and Byzantium generated and supported the development of Tzcheta and led the integration of different cultural influences with the local cultural traditions. After 6th century AD, when the capital was transferred to Tbilisi, Tzcheta continued to retain its leading role as an 
of an important cultural and spiritual cent centers of the country. The historical monuments of Tsheta contain archaeological remains of great significance that testify to the high culture in the art of building masonry, crafts, pottery, as well as metal casting and processing uh, and the social, political, and economic evolution of the mountain kingdom for the some four millennia. They are also represent associative values with religious figures such as San Nino uh, of, from Cappadocia, whose deeds are documented by Georgian, Armenian, Greeks, and Roman historians. The historical monuments of Tsheta World Heritage Site consist of serial property, all attributes that represent the continuous development of the building typology from the 4th century to 8th centuries. The components of the property have retained their material integrity and significant features conveying the outstanding universal value. They form the most important landmarks with, within the cultural landscape of Tsheta River Valley. In line, Tsheta has maintained its role as a, the spiritual and cultural center of the country assumed over since the introduction of Christianity to the region. Recognizing the outstanding universal value of Tsheta and its historical monuments, the World Heritage Committee in 1994 decided to inscribe the historical monuments of Tsheta initially referred as a city museum of Tsheta on the World Heritage List based on the following criteria. Three, um, <coughs> Tsheta historical monuments evidence high art and great culture of the former kingdom of Georgia, which played greatest uh, played greatest role in medieval history of the region. Rare evidences of introduction and spreading of Christianity to mountainous regions of the Caucasus are here. Archaeological monuments and religious complexes of the ancient capital of Georgia and Tsheta reflect social, political, economical evolution of the kingdom during, th uh, during four millennia the best way. Although each monument makes its contribution to the common value of this cultural heritage, this site is made special by their unified value. And criteria four, Tsheta historical monuments, including Jwari Monastery, Svetitskhoveli Cathedral, and Samtavra Monastery, represent their examples of medieval ecclesiastic architecture of the Caucasus region and reflect different periods of architecture of such typology from the fourth century to 18th. Uh, from the century, mm, it's from outstanding universal value elaborated by and submitted by state party in 2011. Similar to other developing countries which have radically transformed the social, economic, and political system in recent decades. Georgia has faced a number of difficulties in implementation of the World Heritage Convention. The problems persistent in con conservation and management of the World Heritage Sites have indi indispensably been linked to the overall social, economical, and political turbulences. As a lower middle income country, Georgia has prioritized rapid economic development, redu reduction of poverty and unemployment, improving investment climate and raising the quality of life of citizens. In such circumstances, developing aspirations have often conform confronted conservation needs and the monument's protection has been compromised for the sake of overall development objectives. In this it was in this context uh, that the lack of the, due to the lack of the implementation of the World Heritage Committee recommendations has led to the ins inscription of the historical monuments of Tsheta in the list of the World Heritage in danger. In this, it's the chosen the World Heritage Committee uh, uh, committee expressed concern over the lack of the sustainable management, coordination, and planning mechanisms, as well as intensive privatization of state owned lands and absence of special programs for safeguarding and long term conservation of archaeological monuments of Tsheta. As a, re as a result of the hard working years involving international high level experts, institutions in the improvement measures taken by state, in active co co collaboration with UNESCO World Heritage Center and its advisory bodies, and in close cooperation with the stakeholders on the national level, in 2016 the property, property was back to the World Heritage Generalist. We are well aware 
that for the state party it means much more responsibilities and obligations to follow the recommendations given by the World Heritage Committee and its advisory body to sustain the already achieved results and further develop the protective mechanisms. In the report, in the report of the Joint World Heritage Center ICOMOS ICROM reactive monitoring mission is underlined that while the state party has achieved remarkable progress in addressing the factors affecting the property, devoting all of its, uh, of all of its efforts to implementing the recommendation provided over the past years, it is noted the basic conservation issues of the property remain crucial. The historic urban landscape of Tsheta is currently undergoing step-by-step -step changes with increased commercial tourist development. Rehabilitation of public spaces and changes in the overall historical urban landscape as well as environmental degradation due to the lack of waste water sewerage management. It should be noted with concern that these threats, if not addressed in time with appropriate and immediate measures may impact in the medium term on the attributes which contribute to the outstanding universal value of the property, including its conditions of authenticity and integrity. Based on the above mentioned report, uh, at its 42nd session, uh, the committee still mentioned the following factors affecting the property. Uh, lack of the definition of the unified buffer zone that has already, al al already resolved. In 2017, the World Heritage Committee at its 41st session approved the, the unified buffer zone for historical monuments of Tsheta and recommends to the state party to elaborate the Tsheta Urban Land Use Master Plan through specific provision to address the management of different areas. Review the range of protective instruments and mechanisms to ensure integrated and comprehensive protection. Then, and you can see on the map the, the unified uh, buffer zone that was approved in 2017 from Tsheta. It's real in, in, enlarged the uh, area uh, to be protected. Uh, and uh, it's real complicated and very crucial, crucial issue uh, in our working agenda. Uh, privatization of surrounding land uh, and inappropriate urban development within sensitive historical environment and this issue is temporary result. The both issues has been uh, resolved through the moratorium, the special regime established by from Tsheta by the governmental decree since 2015 on new reconstructions and state land privatization in archaeological and landscape protection zones as well as at the parts of the building regulation zones. As it is required by the current World Heritage Committee decision of 2018, the moratorium should be maintained on urban development and land privatization in cultural heritage protection zones of Tsheta until the urban planning documentation has been adopted and control and monitoring is fully in place. Lack of the urban master plan of the city of Tsheta. Despite of all efforts, uh, of recent years, towards the elaboration of the special de document development documentation from Tsheta, done in close cooperation with World Heritage Center and its advisory body, the city is still without basic guidelines for further uh, development. In 2015-2017, in the framework of the Triapple Cooperation Agreement between Georgia World Heritage Center and World Bank, the multidisciplinary project has been implemented. Under the agreement, the World Heritage Center assisted the state party in developing the site management instruments above all the urban land use master plan of Tsheta town and facilitated the capacity building for the town administration and other major stakeholders. This cooperation aimed at setting the long-term planning framework and reinforcement of the management mechanism capacities to deal with the integration of heritage protection and development needs. Moreover, the above mentioned co collaboration has been considered as the follow up of the World Heritage Capacity Building Strategy and its a model for fa future capacity building activities in the region. Which, uh, while the capacity building component of the aforementioned project was primarily targeted to the urban planners, it was initiation, initiation, uh, initiation of World Heritage Center to involve in the process the representatives of Georgian Patriarchy, the owners of the Mtscheta World Heritage Monument. The gathering the all responsible stakeholders together and sharing with them the best practices and knowledge in the historical town 
regeneration and management created a favorable platform for further constructive collaboration between the all involved parties to harmonize the different needs in the land use master plan developing process. The other issue reflected by the committee was the lack of management me mechanism, and this issue has been already resolved following the recommendation of the World Heritage Center with the Triapple Corporation. In May, May 2018, the government of Georgia established the Special Steering Committee with the aim to support and to super supervise the elaboration of the management documentation for special territorial development of Tsheta. Uh, the all stakeholders, including relevant ministries, municipality of Tsheta, and the Patriarchate of Georgia are involved in the steering committee. The establishment of the steering committee is an important step to, towards ensuring the participatory process and involvement of the municipality and clergy, as well as the civil society, in the development of the land use master plan and to improve coordinated interministerial and inter inter institutional decision making process regarding the protection of the World Heritage property of Tsheta. The last and most controversial issue. Uh, that was underlined by the committee this year uh, was the insufficient coordination between the Georgian Church and the national authorities. Despite of the active steps done by the state towards establish the collaborative platform to communicate and cooperate with Georgian Patriarchate, the main owner of the most heritage assets in the country, religious assets in the country, including Tsheta historical monuments, based on the Concordat signed in 2002 between the state and the Georgian Patriarchate, the process of enhancing the productive and mutually benefited partnership is progressing very hard and slow. Taking into consideration that Tsheta remains the spiritual center of the country and the holy capital of Georgia, Georgian Patriarchate has very clear and strict vision about the perspectives of the urban development of Tsheta. Uh, uh, arguing on the spiritual links of Tsheta with the new or second Jerusalem. Inter alia holy landmarks with Jerusalem toponyms and its surrounding area like Bethlehem, Tabor, Jordan, Kedron, Getsemania, Golgotha, Sion, and others. Historical courses, liturgical procession, street network, and urban tissue created by the connected of these landmarks, certain part of which exist even today. The Patriarchate is planning to recreate so-called holy urban structure of Tzcheta in New Jerusalem through so-called New Jerusalem, of course, constructing the particular architectural forms within the whole area of buffer zone uh, of historical monuments and Tzcheta, and you can see on the map the uh, situation plan uh, of their concept. Uh, the uh, yellow uh, circles are the places of the development uh, of the pro propo development proposals. The arrangement of the special water channel and integration with the river for the universal baptistry, that uh, ritual, the ritual that was being restored since the 90s in Tzcheta, and arrangement of the bridge over the river to connect Svetitschoveli Cathedral with Jwari Monastery uh, for the pilgrimage tourists is considered as the first project proposal in the framework of the above mentioned concept. To the, to the, the proposed project concept covers in some of cases the private plots of lands of the local population and the municipality lands in other cases who has absolutely different vision on the further development of Tzcheta. The idea of illuminating of the whole city is not welcoming by them and the conflict is increasing between the patriarchate and municipality. Therefore, one of the U UNESCO World Heritage Center main com uh, co recommendations given in the final report of advisory ser service by UNESCO into Georgia in 2015-2017 was that the Georgian authorities define in coordination and involvement of the all stakeholders a shared vision for the town with a varied functional and varied requirements based on the conservation of World Heritage values. Further, the mission underlined that it's very problematic and that a large and comprehensive new development proposals like, like this should be elaborated in parallel to the process of development of the urban planning documentation required by the World Heritage Committee, and it's strongly, strongly urged 
that the state party and the Mtsketa Urban Planning Steering Committee to take into consideration relevant measures without delay. In previous reports in 2014, ICOMOS also noted these sites are functionally linked through a, a lit litany uh, which represents the venerable pilgrimage to the holy city of Christendom, Jerusalem. This interpretation of Tzcheta has similarities with other places where, where monuments were intended to evoke the real Jerusalem, such as churches intended to represent the Church of Holy Sepulchre, like the seven churches of San, San Stefano in Bologna, Italy, and others. Jerusalem was regarded as the ideal city in the Middle Age. Accordingly, the idea perhaps could be used to explain the development of the medieval city of Tzcheta and would influence the way limits of development were defined. Thus the, thus, the management of the property should aim not only towards the maintenance of its outstanding universal value, but also towards the maintenance of the spiritual values, which are primary importance to the religious community. In 2018, the Joint Reactive Monitoring Mission report once more stressed out the urgent need to harmonize the new Jerusalem concept with the elaboration of urban planning documentation for Mtscheta and recommended to the state party to request advisory assistance from the World Heritage Center and its advisory body to guide such a complex process and to organizing collaboration with the relevant stakeholders in Georgia, the World Heritage Center and its advisory bodies and international workshop to publicity discuss the existing in several countries concept of New Jerusalem. Further, the decision of the current decision of 2018 adopted by the World Heritage Committee invites the state parties to implement the case studies and consultations on living religious sec and sacred World Heritage properties in the historical urban context. Moreover, moreover, the mission recommended to implement the heritage impact assessments at the strategic level. This has been also including the recommendations for sustainable tourism considering the specificity of World Heritage uh, 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 tourist World Heritage Strategy of Georgia. In these very complicated circumstances, when there is a crucial necessity to reach a consensus between the all involved parties and ensure the outstanding universal value of this World Heritage property, following the all valuable recommendations provided by the World Heritage Center and its advisory bodies, the state party is planning to organize in 2019 an international workshop to publicly discuss the existing in several countries concept of New Jerusalem that will help us to find most appropriate and relevant solutions for maintaining and strengthening the spiritual and cultural values of the city and ensure its sustainable development of, for welfare of the local population. And in close, I would like to invite all of you participants of Kiev Seminar to Georgia during the fall of the next year to the upcoming conference to discuss the possibilities how to develop the New Jerusalem theological concept to maintain or enhance the OUV of this site. And I do hope that, that with, with your great assistance and active involvement in the process and sharing with your experiences, we will manage to find the most appropriate solutions acceptable for Georgian patriarchate as well as for local po population. Thank you very much. So I will continue uh, from the floor. Uh, I would like to invite. Uh, uh, I, do, I know, no, I, I, I want to do it. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maria Salupi Crescenzi, expert from Vatican Museums, Holy See. Please. First of all, I would like to thank for the warm uh, welcome. The Ukrainian have been overdoing for us the perfect organization. It's my first time here, and I wouldn't... I wasn't sure I could join this seminar, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the presentation will be not as uh, strictly done as yours. I find myself in this fourth session, which is, is entitled Living Religious and Sacred World Heritage in a Historic Urban Context. 
But as I'm representing the Holy See, I feel a bit <laughs> embarrassed because I don't have any urban context, historic urban context, unless the historic center of Rome is the buffer zone of the Vatican City <laughs> State. <laughs> because uh, there is a lot of um, misunderstanding between these two terms, Vatican City and Holy See. And perhaps it's, it, it, it's worthwhile to, to, to understand properly what are we talking about. Because the Vatican City State, which I'm representing here as a focal point on the convention, is the smallest independent state of the world, which is inscribed on the World Heritage List since 19 1984. While the Holy See is, um, well, most people think interchangeably that the terms can be used interchangeably. Uh, Vatican City and Holy See are entirely distinct entities. The Holy See, Santa Sedes, is an independent sovereign entity and the top spiritual governing body. The Bishop of Rome rules through the Roman Curia. The Holy See, or the Apostolic See, is the top diocese and central government of the Roman Catholic Church with universal authority. The international bodies recognize the Holy See as a sovereign body capable of diplomatic relations with other countries, it has with 183 countries, and have the permanent observer status in the meetings of the United Nations. Unlike Vatican City State, which became a state in Vatican City, which became a state in 1929, uh, is, is, uh, is the piece of land on which the um, sovereign pontiff can exercise his mandate. So the Pope is Bishop of Rome and successor of Peter and, and therefore the Vicar of Christ and the Holy See is the chair of the Bishop of Rome. But the Vatican City is the smallest independent state in the world in terms, in terms of inhabitants and size. It occupies an area of 44 hectares we saw 23 yesterday in the Lavra. Well, we were told that they have 23 hectares. Um, the borders are represented by its walls and the travertine pavement curve that joins the two wings of the colonnades Bernini's in St. Peter's Square. Beyond the proper territory of the state, Vatican jurisdiction also covers some extraterritorial areas within and outside the historic center of Rome. As you all may know, in 1990, the historic center of Rome, after, um, uh, upon request of the World Heritage Committee, had to um, um, enlarge the, the limits, enlarge the, um, the property, so that it would include the extra um, territorial uh, pro uh, the, the, um, properties of the Holy See enjoying extraterritorial rights, such as the big basilica, St. John the Latran, which is the Cathedral of Rome, and uh, St. Mary the Major, and Renaissance buildings, and others, which are spread within the historic center of Rome. Profound interest has incessantly addressed by, I want to, I have, with you. Profound interest as incessantly addressed by the church with respect to the progress of culture and the arts, as well as fruitful dialogue with them. The promotion of culture assumes a higher value because it falls among the means, I'm quoting Gaudium Express, means whereby man develops and perfects his many bodily and spiritual qualities. In the aspiration to that integral perfection, which implies a long journey but sanctions the supreme dignity of the human individual. The church has given the world not only monuments, churches, cult places with painted and sculpted decoration, but also libraries, archives, music, the Specola Vaticana, the obser astronom Astronomical Observatory, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. The church, through, through its history, has always supported and promoted not only the, the arts, but also the sciences, and the arts in particular in full awareness of their value as a universal language of unique importance in order to reach all the human beings. It's a universal church. The church financed the realization of the great masterpieces and offered the greatest artists the scriptural subjects of faith so that art would reclothe them with integral beauty. Today, the church is concerned to protect and en enhance the places which are sacred to both the faith and universal culture. 
by ensuring the maximum visibility and the best environmental conditions. The spiritual and artistic excellence meets the comparable and necessary excellence of modern technology which has been placed in its services. The first important ethical duty is to preserve the heritage which has been entrusted and to pass it on to those who will come after in the best possible conditions preventing, preventing the risk of decay and allowing men and of today or who have not yet born the greatest delight possible. But the Vatican City State is not a museum. It is for pilgrims and tourists, but at the same time it's a living working place um, in which the uh, Pope's action, uh, pastoral action is granted and uh, for him and for his collaborators. However, protection, restoration, conservation, prevention, safeguarding, promotion are granted to the um, historic, artistic, cultural and spiritual heritage of the Holy See. Either in terms of preservation of the spirit of place, all of you might have been to the Sistine Chapel where the Pope is still elected, the election of the Pope is held, or to the Basilica of St. Peter's where, I mean, okay, which is a cult place and uh, without being a converting place, and either the material conservation and transmission to the future gen generations. This is more my field because I work in the Vatican Museums. And the Vatican Museums have restoration labor laboratories divided for different materials, seven great laboratories, which were founded in the year 20s of the past century, and, and which have a very, very huge task to, because they have to, um, they are responsible for overseeing restoration works carried out either intramania or extramania, so within the Vatican city state and in the extraterritorial properties. And they are responsible for overseeing restoration works carried out by ex uh, internal professional, well-trained professional, and external professional. So in the case, uh, since 1981, we have a very strict, um, uh, we have very strict guidelines which have been um, published on the Vatican Museum's bulletin in 1981, which established for the restoration of works of art. And the guidelines establishes the collaboration of both the technical and the scientific staff under the direction of the historian, in I and which is the secret to the success of the restoration labs at the Vatican Museums. So the Diagnostic Laboratory for Conservation, Conservation Laboratories and Art Historians or Archaeologists or Anthropologists are always strictly intertwined in, in, um, in, um, in the works of, um, of resp or restoration. And in the case of restoration carried out with the assistance of specialized external firms, the laboratories are providing them with protocols and basic guidelines for the various working phases. This procedure ensures that the philological, methodological, scientific indications of conservation applied in the works belonging to the Holy See maintain a common identity. In the recent, in, 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 in uh, everybody ha might have heard about the restoration of the century as it, as it was called at the time of the, the restoration uh, held in the Sistine Chapel since 1981 and 1994. Uh, as a matter of fact, this restoration, we changed the history of restoration and also uh, uh, obliged to change the history of arts pages uh, on, on Michelangelo's way of painting and then was um, was, was uh, has now uh, moved to a different concept. Instead of huge um, important historical uh, world renowned restorations, the philosophy has changed. And since 2008, the Vatican Museum's conservative, uh, Conservators office, office has been um, founded, uh, which has the task of developing strategies and provision for lowering the risk threshold and improving the quality of the historical, artistic, and archaeological patrimony preventing or slowing the process of deterioration of deterioration of the materials that constitute the works of art through the monitoring of their surrounding environment and adopting programmatic plans for care and ordinary maintenance. 
Outside the museums, the office performs its activity in all the places of representation or worship where required by the Holy See in exercising its tutelary functions inside and outside the state. So, uh, so prevent better than restore. This is the philosophy, philosophy which has taken over since 2008. Thank you to our former director, Antonio Paolucci. And, when res and, and uh, moreover, the, the works are granted by the necessary advice of a standing commission of protection of historical and artistic monuments of the Holy See, which has to give its advice for any kind of restoration. And any restoration has to be approved, presented and approved by the president of governorate of the Vatican City State, which is uh, the organism um, which is um, ruling the internal affairs of the Vatican City State. And uh, the legal frame is granted by the Law on Protection of Cultural Heritage, which was issued in 2001 and, and which is also deposited in, in, in UNESCO. So this is the way we try to, the, the Holy See is trying to grant the, 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 the best visibility, the best um, conservation of its, of its uh, patrimony. And uh, all these monuments and the Vatican museums are, of, uh, are granting access to thousands of visitors. Only in the museums we have uh, an average of 25,000 per day, 6,300,000 in the year 2017 without racial, social, cultural, or religious exclusion, respecting the dignity of the person iner inherent in each created individual. There are men and women coming literally from all corners of the planet, professing, professing different religions, perhaps no one, no one, who do not otherwise have occasion to come near to the evangelical message unless through artistic expression. Everyone is enabled to share in a heritage of mankind which UNESCO recognizes as being of exceptional universal value. Thank you. I didn't go in detail because we have so many different kinds. Perhaps you can then ask and pose your questions when we have time. Because I didn't want to exceed with the times and, uh, and I'm ready to, to answer later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation and I would like to invite Tamara Murusiuk, uh, Vice Principal Yuri Fedorovich Chernivsky National University with the presentation of the special aspects of the management of the residents of uh, Bokov Bokovinian and Dalmatinian Metropolitans as a World Heritage property. <laughs> Доброго дня, шановні учасники сьогоднішнього семінару. Як відомо, 2018 рік Єврокомісія оголосила роком культурної спадщини. Україна підтримала цю пропозицію і оголосила 2018 рік роком збереження культурної спадщини. І на початку випадково ми всі зібралися в Києві, в столиці України, для проведення цього семінару. Адже, тож вітаю всіх, хто приїхав, завітав до нас на Україну. Адже всі ми велика родина, яка дбає про збереження минулого заради майбутнього наших народів. Тепер дозвольте перейти безпосередньо до теми виступу, сьогоднішнього виступу. Один з найвизначніших монархів Австро-Угорщини – Імператор Франц Йосиф свого часу зауважував сила і велич держави в її культурі. В часи його правління Буковина входила до складу Австро-Угорщини, і саме тому вишукана архітектура стала невід'ємною складовою її розвитку. Франц Йосиф нині в стінах резиденції митрополитів Буковини і Далмаці розташований Чернівецький національний університет імені Юрія Федьковича. Ініціатором будівництва єпископської резиденції 
Виступи видатний церковний, громадський і політичний діяч. Перший митрополит Буковини і Далмації – Євген Гакман. Саме він зупинив свій погляд на постаті молодого австрійського архітектора чеського походження Йозефа Главки, який і спроєктував архітектурне диво Буковини. 28 червня 2011 року на засіданні 35-ї сесії Комітету Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО, що проходила у Парижі, неперевершений архітектурний шедевр був включений до списку Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО. До речі, із 46 представлених до номінування об'єктів, в той момент було включено лише 29. І серед цих об'єктів – резиденція, яка була єдиним об'єктом, представленим від країн Східної Європи. Нелегкий процес номінування – був успішно завершений завдяки спільній співпраці професорсько-викладацького складу адміністрації університету, Національної комісії України у справах ЮНЕСКО, Українського національного комітету і КОМОСу, постійного представництва України при ЮНЕСКО у Парижі. У роботі 35-ї сесії Комітету Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО брала участь і українська делегація. Ось ви бачите присутній посол України у Франції – Олександр Купчишин. До складу цієї делегації ходили ректор університету і автор цієї доповіді. Разом із включенням до списку ЮНЕСКО 13 років тому, після 13 років перерви, а останній об'єкт центр Львова був включений в 98-му році, а 35-та сесія в 2011-му році, були ми стали свідками ще однієї позитивної ініціативи університету. Так, під час засідання 35-ї сесії українська делегація презентувала київську резолюцію, у якій йшлося про захист об'єктів релігійної спадщини в рамках Конвенції про охорону Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО. Приємно зазначити, що саме українська пропозиція лягла в основу започаткованої ЮНЕСКО ініціативи щодо збереження культурної спадщини релігійного призначення, власне чому і присвячений сьогоднішній наш семінар. Як кажуть, нічого в житті випадкового немає. Дві визначні події для України, включення резиденції до списку ЮНЕСКО і підтримка київської резолюції відбулися одночасно під час засідання 35-ї сесії ЮНЕСКО. Резиденція, як ніякий інший об'єкт ЮНЕСКО, український чи світовий, відзеркалює окреслену ініціативу і найбільш наочно демонструє можливість її втілення у життя. Варто зазначити, що резиденція, як об'єкт Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО, суттєво відрізняється від інших українських об'єктів, включених до списку ЮНЕСКО. Без сумніву, резиденцію, як пам'ятку ЮНЕСКО, слід розглядати в декількох площинах. З одного боку, як навчальну і наукову інституцію, підпорядковану Міністерству освіти і науки, ви можете спостерігати на території резиденції по святу першокурсників у студенти, так і об'єкт Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО, з іншого боку, Якщо як навчальна і наукова інституція університет підпорядкований Міністерству освіти України, то як об'єкт Всесвітньої спадщини – Міністерство культури України. Ну і, звісно, подвійне підпорядкування значною мірою ускладнює функціонування об'єкту Всесвітньої спадщини, адже жодне з міністерств не бере на себе відповідальність щодо збереження і охорони об'єкту Всесвітньої спадщини. Слід зазначити, що з понад тисячі об'єктів, які на 2018 рік включені до списку об'єктів Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО, лише вісім об'єктів світу виконують подвійну функцію, як навчальна наукова інституція і плюс об'єкт Всесвітньої спадщини. Звісно, в Україні це лише єдиний наш об'єкт. Слід наголосити, що поряд із двома цими функціями Університет виконує ще одну надзвичайну відповідальну місію, яка пов'язана безпосередньо з її історичним минулим. Так, резиденція, як архітектурний комплекс, займає територію у 8 гектарів. До складу її входять митрополичий корпус, корпус теологічної семінарії, 
Будинок для приїжджих, у кресленнях Йосифа Главки, архітектора, він окреслений як монастир. Крім цього, до комплексу входить семінарська церква, ви можете бачити, двір кордонер та парк і паркові споруди. Двір кордонер і парк, і паркові споруди. Початкове призначення корпусу теологічної семінарії – Ось корпус теологічної семінарії, бачите, височі церква трьохсвятительська або семінарська церква. Корпус теологічної семінарії призначався для навчання студентів греко-православного теологічного факультету. На той час, в 1875 році, коли Франц Йосиф дав добро на відкриття університету, коли був заснований університет, він складався лише з трьох факультетів – філософського, юридичного і теологічного. Офіційною датою початку будівництва в резиденції вважається 8 липня 1864 року, день закладення єпископом Євгеном Гакманом угольного каменя у фундамент домової церкви, каплиці святого Іоанна Сучавського – яка розташована у митрополичому корпусі. Звісно, будівництво грандіозного комплексу супроводжувалося чималими труднощами, як об'єктивного, так і суб'єктивного характеру. Адже за 18 років, скільки будувалася резиденція, змінилось 4 митрополити і 4 керівника будівництва. 1882 рік прийнято вважати завершенням будівництва резиденції, завершенням будівництва резиденції. Як бачите, воно тривало не 8 років, як то хотів митрополит Євген Гакман, не 10, як планував австрійський уряд, а 18 років, а 18 років з 1864 по 1882 рік. У 1882 році митрополит Сільвестр освятив обидві церкви на території резиденції. У січні – Домову церкву Іоанна Сучавського в лютому, в День Собору Трьох Святителів Василія Великого, Григорія Богослова і Іоанна Златоуста, семінарську або Трьох Святительську церкву. І до сьогоднішнього дня ця церква носить назву Трьох Святительської церкви. Якщо домова церква задовільняла потреби єпископату, то семінарська виконувала функції, бази практик для студентів-теологів і завжди була відчинена для прихожан. У 1882 році студенти богослову утворили товариство Академії Ортодокса, Православна Академія. Приємно констатувати, що нещодавно студенти філософсько-теологічного факультету відновили в університеті діяльність товариства Академії Ортодокса як спокоємниці славних традицій теологічної освіти греко-орієнтального богословського факультету. Слід зазначити, що теологічний факультет університету на той час – друга половина XIX століття, будучи єдиним в Австро-Угорщині, досить швидко набув значення провідного центру з підготовки православних богословів у Південно-Східній Європі. Звісно, радянське панування на Буковині перервало історію теологічного факультету. І лише у грудні 1993 року, завдяки зусиллям тодішнього ректора університету, єпископа Чернівецької Буковинського, нині митрополита Чернівецької Кіцменського, Данила і громадськості Буковини була відновлена історична справедливість. За словами Степана Костишина, усе розпочалося з університетської церкви. Ви бачите, церква і корпус теологічної факультету. Справу необхідно було повести так, аби цей храм почав діяти як релігійна установа. Зрозуміло, що в радянській часі ні про які релігійні установи, теологічні факультети мова йти не могла. Бо були пропозиції, тоді ще з боку радянської влади, відкрити тут філіал бібліотеки. Та попри це ректорат і вчена рада університету підійшли до долі церкви дуже виважено, прийнявши доленосне рішення паралельно з відкриттям, відновленням церкви, відновити теологічний факультет. Зрозуміло, це ще не означало, що мети було досягнуто. Нас намагалися переконати в тому, що функціонування богословського факультету, я підкреслюю, в світському навчальному закладі неможливо. Але ми стояли на своєму і знаходили вагомі контраргументи. Передусім, це те, що факультет не створюється, а відновлюється історична справедливість. У наказі Міністерства освіти України 93-й рік лише 
Незалежність Україна була незалежні в 91-му і через два роки міністерство зазначало, беручи до уваги рішення міжгалузевої акредитаційної комісії, колегії Міністерства освіти, рішення вченої ради відкрити, підкреслюю, було записано, а не відновити у Чернівецькому державному університеті філософсько-теологічний факультет. Отже, цього року філософсько-теологічний факультет відзначає своє 25-річчя. В урочистостях в урочистостях з нагоди його відновлення взяли участь, взяв участь патріарх Київський і всієї Русі святійший Володимир Романюк. Була підписана на той час університетом і Київською духовною академією угода, яка дозволяла здійснювати підготовку студентів богословів у єдиному в Україні світському навчальному закладі. У 2003 році з благословення патріарха Київської сії Русі Філарета була підписана нова угода про спільну освітню діяльність, що дало змогу уніфікувати навчальні плани богословського відділення і розв'язати чимало проблем, пов'язаних із видачою дипломів. Нині ліцензовано спеціальність богослів'я на освітніх рівнях бакалав і магістр. Університетська церква, яка має ставропігійний статус, пряме економічне підпорядкування патріарху, а не місцевому архієрею, служить лабораторією, де студенти богослови закріплюють на практиці набуті ними теоретичні знання з літургійного богослов'я, структури православної церкви, пастирського богослов'я. У святкові та недільні дні в храмі відправляється богослужіння, здійснюються різні треби, вінчання, хрещення. Щороку завідувач богословського відділення отець Микола здійснює обряд освячення першокурсників університету у студенти. Приємно, що церкву відвідують студенти. В її стінах відбуваються заупокійні літії такого національно-патріотичного виховання, вшанування жертв голодоморів, учасників антитерористичної операції, відбуваються концерти духовної музики. Поряд у з освітньою діяльністю у 2009 році з благословення Філарета було розпочато реставрацію домового храму. От ви можете бачити домовий храм, це домовий храм митрополита. В жовтні 2010 року був здійснений обряд освячення відновленої домової церкви. Враховуючи заслуги патріарха Філарета, у розбудові теологічної освіти, тісної співпраці і розуміння потреб та запитів університету Святійший Патріат Київський всієї Русі Філарет цьогоріч отримав найвищу нагороду від знаку університету звання «Почесний доктор» Чернівецького національного університету імені Юрія Федьковича з врученням йому мантії і диплома. Отже, на момент подання номінаційного досьє на предмет включення резиденції до списку ЮНЕСКО в її стінах розташовувалися в митрополичому корпусі адміністрація університету, факультет іноземних мов і діюча домова церква, у семінарському корпусі філософсько-теологічний і філологічний факультети, у будинку для приїжджих географічний факультет і, без сумніву, трьохсвятительська церква. Отже, у стінах резиденції об'єктів Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО Успішно співпрацюють студенти і викладачі, священники і прихожани. Після здобуття резиденції міжнародного визнання значно посилився інтерес до її визначної універсальної цінності. З кожним роком зростає кількість туристів, які прагнуть відвідати унікальний об'єкт, як з точки зору архітектури, так і толерантного співіснування з одного боку університетської спільноти, яка забезпечує науковий і духовний простір, а з іншого – прихожан Трьохсвятительської і Домової церкви. Величний комплекс резиденцій митрополитів Буковини і Далмації поставив всі свої могутні красі. Він проглядається з відстані до 10 кілометрів на під'їздах до міста і замикає з собою головні осі декількох чернівецьких вулиць. Формує і прикрашає величні панорами міста, притягує чернівчан, сотні тисяч туристів і гостей міста. Але ніколи не побачили цю велич у всій її розкішній простоті, завершеної дві людини – митрополит Буковини і Далмаці Євген Гакман і архітектор Йозеф Главка. Чи сподівались два велетні представники з одного боку релігійного кліру, 
а з другого боку держави, що їх творіння резиденція через майже півтора сторіччя змінить свій статус і отримає визнання людства. Нині важливе завдання нашого сьогодення полягає не лише у збереженні історичних чинників, а насамперед йдеться про зміну освітніх парадигм і духовне відродження української нації. У нашому випадку крізь призму охорони і збереження об'єкту Всесвітньої спадщини ЮНЕСКО, резиденції митрополитів Буковини і Далмації, де розташований Чернівецький національний університет імені Юрія Федьковича. Дякую за увагу. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite I would like to invite Dr. Shadia Mahmoud, the Director General of the International Organizations for Cultural Heritage, Ministry of Antiquities of Egypt, on the with the presentation of Living Religious Heritage, the concept of the authenticity as a determinator in social and religious practice, historic Cairo. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, actually seminar. I, I thank the organizations who participate uh, in organizing this uh, such unique uh, seminar. And afternoon, everybody. Close. This, okay. Good afternoon. Actually, I would like to speak today uh, uh, about the concept of authenticity as a determinant to social and religious practice in historic Cairo. First, I would like to introduce you the background of historic Cairo. It's well known for uh, um, the majority of you who are from Arab, actually, countries, that his, uh, Cairo is one of the largest cities in Middle East, which uh, credit for writing and recording history. It's known as a jewel of the East because historic Cairo dates to more than a thousand years old and includes nearly 90% of the Islamic and Coptic monuments nationwide. Uh, the monuments actually in historic Cairo, it's rich in quantities and uh, qualities. Uh, historic Cairo is inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1979 because of its exceptional historical and cultural value. Uh, Egypt government focused on the city in the 19th of 90s of the last century when it uh, initiated a project for the restoration and development of historic Cairo. Uh, this restoration actually initiated by UNESCO when they created a small unit from uh, UNESCO to uh, chair with the Egyptian government the project of uh, the development of and restoration of historic Cairo. And this started uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, the primary objective of this project is to create a whole new range of museums and historical sites that will be available on wide range for both citizens and tourists. Um, I think I need to put kind of like question mark for citizens because we are going back again to this uh, point. This project continued and according to the involved authorities in this project, historic Cairo shines as well until many problems were raised after the 25 January uh, revolution. Uh, the Egyptian government could con uh, couldn't continue actually in financing the projects because of the, you know, finance, uh, fi uh, the problem in uh, funding and also political problem or stop the huge number of illegal constructions resulted from uh, lawlessness uh, that prevailed in the country during that period. Those problems were addressed also by UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee. I think the main, the main problem for, for our actually old city, old Cairo or historic Cairo, actually I don't prefer um, the the title historic Cairo because it's a living city uh, when we call uh, something historic it's a kind of like rigid it's not live anymore but this is like you know a live uh, city and uh, actually for me personally I don't prefer historic Cairo uh, now uh, the the thing that uh, make actually the complication in historic uh, Cairo in Erie uh, organizing uh, development or restoration or even engagement the local community that many people stakeholders like you know involved in the administrative administrative and executive system of cultural heritage not just in historic Cairo but in several also historical uh, uh, cultural heritage sites in Egypt in this case actually historic Cairo we have 
several of ministries that are involved in the uh, administration and uh, the management of this city. Ministry of Antiquities, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Awqaf, Ministry of Housing, Cairo Governorate, and also we have the Ministry of International Cooperation, the Ministry of Development and uh, Urban uh, Civilization. We have also um, uh, underneath this ministries uh, several uh, uh, departments like you know the Supreme Council of Antiquities that belong to Ministry of Antiquities, Project Sector, Historic Cairo Department, General Administration of Cairo Traffic, and you can imagine how it be, be it will be very complicated to uh, deal with all these like ministries and organizations, and how to solve the problem while many people are involved and sometimes they are conflicted in decision and like you know. Um, uh, the uh, management of this unique city. Historic Cairo, or I prefer Old Cairo, is a city where diverse people since its establishment in 7th century AD, and this is the time that Fatimid people, like you know, the uh, Fatimid uh, dynasty come to Egypt and they start to um, uh, uh, establish this unique uh, city, and it started by uh, the Fatimid <coughs> monuments at that time. Come together to negotiate these people who are residing in this unique city. They come together, they have their own life, they come to, uh, together to negotiate, perform social and religious activities, exchange goods, etc. The interaction between this diverse group of people produces the innovations and development of ideas, structure, and architecture in cities. The Egyptian government focused on, here I show you, this is, you know, Bab al Futuh built in 480, and this is one of the, because when the Fatima dynasty established this unique uh, city, they make it as a closed city surrounding by four uh, gates. The one of them, uh, this Babel Futuh built in 480 AH and uh, uh, 1087 AD. And this is also uh, called the wall of uh, Econater. And this is be before the old time, during the Fitimid uh, time, it was all this surrounding by water, but nowadays not anymore. And this is part of historic Cairo, the same, the same shape, but you know that the social life that's surrounding this uh, area is not anymore the same like you see in this bend. The Egyptian government focused on the city in the 90s of the last century when, uh, I repeat this, sorry. Um, the state said, like, you know, the Egyptian government said that many problems have, have been initiated after or during the revolution, and people start to attack actually any restoration or development project that made by the government or even the unit that has been created by UNESCO, and they started to construct illegal uh, building in this area. But the reason I think for this, and according to just not my opinion, also by, uh, 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 several of culture manager and also archaeologists and also engineers, that the local community never been involved in this project from the initiative. They never been consulted why we are doing this to your unique city, why we are coming to you to develop your city. And as soon as they found kind of like, you know, revolution or any demonstration, they used the it's chance to distract any development that has been made uh, no, not according to their desire. And uh, the debate here actually for me, authenticity is a significant concept in the field of cultural heritage. However, the implication of authenticity and its relevance to social and religious practice need further consideration. The concept of authenticity was initiated in Venice Charter in 1964 and the professional of cultural heritage in UNESCO and in its advisory bodies, ECOMOS, IUCN, and the ECROM exercise their authoritative power in the process of evaluation, selection, and conservation of the potential sites. 
I do respect all the experts in the, all the world, actually, who are participating in all these or international organizations, and also the, um, the concept of authenticity that they come up with and has been developed through the tourism uh, uh, sector or even social you know, studies, etc. And uh, until now, several uh, research uh, has been done, actually, to try to define this, the idea of authenticity. But, uh, in the, our actually culture uh, studies, uh, all people or even the, the experts from the international organization, uh, they uh, perceive the authenticity as a kind of like, we have to preserve this uh, any monuments as a rigid thing. Not considering the people, the local community, not considering that it's a very unique and it has been developed over years and years by adding by people. If we are going to just preserve this as a stone and not touch by any other people, no development anymore, and we will not be credited for any development in the future. So it will be just stopped for the last centuries that has been developed during uh, this time. And it's study analyze how the stakeholders of uh, historic Cairo imposes the concept of authenticity on local and social religious practices in the process of heritage preservation and management. Historic Cairo has a unique architectural identity and the character of the streets is already established by building the spaces and activities that take place along the street. Without considering the social, religious, economical, ecological factors involved, it's not possible to generate secure uh, uh, principles for <coughs> development. However, development is focused mainly on tourism attraction. And this is the main problem. I will just uh, go to show you, this is the Buffer zone, if you find the, the purple color, this is the old buffer zone that, you know, it has been in uh, historic Cairo. And then the new project proposed and already approved now, and we have to implement this, approve this, the yellow, all this buffer uh, zone. In order to do all this, we have to reconstruct all the downtown of historic Cairo and the surrounding area, and all this, has been established for like you know more than now like uh, um, two or three centuries, and this is big problems of course. But we, in order to preserve and also go with the international community, we already approved this uh, new buffer zone. But for the people, they can't imagine how they are, we are going to move all this actually uh, buffer zone to uh, historic Cairo, and where like you know they already attached to these places due to the pathways that surrounding them they uh, they share everything together they even develop like you know all the social activities and religious they actually add to this the uniqueness of this city and this is the main problem that okay as a professionals we are working to develop this new buffer zone and also we restore all the uh, monuments and we prevent even some people to uh, participate inside uh, like using like you know these monuments to uh, do this uh, religious activities that they used to do it for thousands of a year and we are going with, ag with our agenda but the local community don't agree actually with us and we also face uh, many many problems and i show you here after the improvement of the new buffer zone there is here the all like series committee executive board general coordinator of historic cairo all this kind of like you know people who participate to develop the historic cairo but as you can see you can't find the existence of local community no representative of the local community and this is how like you know i show you how the social and religious practices historic uh, in historic cairo these people who um, used to bring water to houses they they gather together to have um, a smoking uh, like shisha it's a water pipe it's a very famous in historic cairo and they they just like uh, start to sing together and to um, even like you know develop kind of like folklore things all this attached to the also the heritage of historic uh, cairo all this uh, social life in historic cairo but this is the new social life in historic cairo which it has been organized through the government 
through us. But the other, like the, in the left side, this is from the people, this is natural, and you will find the upper one on the right. This is already organized by the, our institutions, uh, governmental institutions or even private organizations. But when you interview local community, they said, like, okay, this is our educated people. You are bringing, like, you know, university students, which okay, but we don't find ourselves in this social activities. We have to have our own natural social activity. And this is also uh, uh, bent by Orientalist. And I show here how, like, you know, it, the, the idea of historic Cairo that possesses many, actually, uh, monuments from different uh, like uh, religion, uh, religious uh, periods, from the Jewish, from the Coptic, from the Islamic. From the Coptic, we have like very unique uh, churches, and also the Coptic museum, and uh, we have also from the Jewish uh, uh, several uh, temples, and we have also uh, from the Islam Muslim um, periods actually more than 1,000 minarets in this you know historic uh, Cairo. Okay. And uh, so it is complex, the religious complex is located in this historic Cairo. And the I show like this is the development of Shar al Muez, one of the streets in historic Cairo. This is before and this is after. This is after and this is before you find cars and all this, this uh, interruption for the people. And this is the Mulit, religious activities. <coughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for all presenters. Uh, and I would like to ask you if you have some questions to participants of this session. I have a, ex a question for you, for the colleague from Georgia. Uh, maybe I did not understand it well. How did it come, this idea of Jerusalem, for these uh, three very precious monuments in Georgia, which are very important ones? But how did it come? It, come, it came from the church, uh, from the local community? Okay. The idea was generated during the medieval. And now in the 21st century, it was the chosen by the Patriarch of Georgia. He declared about this the chosen from the Tribune of Church on the Sunday liturgy in 2013 to, to, to develop Tzcheta as a new Jerusalem. So it was, but it has some, um, some roots in the medieval and the historical pasts, uh, the linkage of the theoretical and the theocratical uh, linkage you have with the New Jerusalem in Tzcheta, starting from the very first structure of ecclesiastic uh, fair, of uh, Christian fair, sorry. So, um, I would like to put a question on the Jordan project. We have seen some very interesting buildings representing the different faiths, but in the way they are placed on the ground, I'm afraid that they do not exhibit yet a kind of a fusion, kind of a link together. So it would be interesting, and I suppose perhaps it has been done already, to develop a more cohesive approach on the base of a master plan. A master plan where every one of these churches would find its place, but also its links with the other parts. So that it is not an addition of things, but a fusion of things and a hope for the future of collaboration. Uh, thank you for your question. I think that would be, uh, if they want to do that, they should have done it from the beginning. Yeah, but um, some of the churches already built, but they're working on uh, the cohesion between them so that the churches should follow a 
each church follow their uh, architectural style, but in respect of the, of the landscape. And there is no walls between the churches. So to facilitate the circulation between the churches and to, to send this uh, message of, of all, like all Christians from, the, from all the denominations in the same site. So there is no walls between the churches. But I think uh, having a master plan, it should have been done from the beginning. But at the beginning, they, they just focused on the uh, architectural guidelines instead of an urban, urban uh, point of view. It's never too late. Yeah, maybe maybe I can I can suggest that to the commission if they want to uh, continue on the other uh, not yet built uh, structures. Thank you. Any other questions to speakers of the last session? Uh, I'm sorry. The same question about New Jerusalem in Georgia. But you, like expert, uh, how do you find this uh, this concept to 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 fair Renaissance one medieval e e e idea? Because in Lithuania we have some examples that didn't have success. This was really uh, hypothetic ideas. They didn't have success, and the society was divided and was really really expensive. What what your your expression? Yes, as an expert, um, I'm uh, fully against of this idea, uh, and um, we try the discussion on the national level to have the constructive discussion with clergy. Uh, but today, the uh, Georgian Patriarchate is very closed with the, the Jesus. They don't neg negotiation, despite I did not mention in my presentation. Um, it should be very long. We have signed in recent years two uh, documents with Patriarchate of Georgia. One is the Memorandum of uh, Collaboration that uh, gives us the main frame of uh, partnership. And another was the uh, agreement on collaboration between the Council uh, of the Restoration and Architecture of the Patriarchate and the National Agency, my institution, that, uh, that provides the operational instruments for joint administration and management of the site. Unfortunately, the, all these sections are the play in one, from one, just from one side. And the clergy, we in often, the more, in the most uh, cases, we, uh, we get information from the decision. Afterwards, we listen from the TV and news. So it's, it's, it's a moment when the project has been already baptized and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely almost impossible to turn everything back. But this idea has developed for last uh, recent years. So therefore, in 2014, in 2013, the uh, reactive monitoring missions, advisory missions, continuously offered to Patriarchate of Georgia to arrange the conference to discuss with the uh, spiritual, with the ecclesiastic um, uh, entities from other countries to share with their experience and how to develop uh, their uh, theoretical idea and uh, how it needs in general to, to create any physical, material, architectural form to develop this uh, theoretical idea. Uh, unfortunately, um, as in all other cases, all activities that should be um, made by church usually are funded by state. And at last, we decide to take this responsibility to arrange this uh, this uh, conference because the actions towards the developing this idea now it's very active. They have already. Um, on the base of the negotiations with the government of Georgia, they, <coughs> the state allocated the exact funds, and the first project design was initiated in 2000, at the end of the 2017. Uh, we stopped it in January, and with the great help of the reactive monitoring mission, and now we have very, very complicated communication. They are very angry with us that we stopped. And we explained that we don't are um, against or uh, we, we cannot do any step towards supporting this project at this stage. 
until until we reach the uh, solution between the all parties, including the local community and municipality, and in collaboration with the UNESCO Center to ensure that this project will not affect the outstanding universal value. The main, con uh, main concern is that not to receive the some theatrical, um, theatric scenery, scenario in, from Tsheta, some butaforial uh, arrangements of the New Jerusalem that will create and turn into a sketch of this universal, really outstanding site um, of this region. Thank you. If there is no more questions, uh, I propose you to pass to, to the presentations of the session, the session's conclusion and recommendations. And I give the floor uh, to the general rapporteur of, uh, of our seminar, Mr. Christopher Young. Thank you very much. And I apologize for missing part of this morning's session, but I was involved with Ukrainian bureaucracy which was actually much less arduous than I expected it to be, which was good. Um, but the rapporteurs of each session will report on what was done. In this session, we are running a bit late, so if we can keep it precise, that will be good, because we all want our lunch, at least I do, and you want your lunch. Um, so if each rap rapporteur could summarize the conclusions of their session, what they could think comes out of their session, and recommendations that they think should be in the report, that would be very useful. And I think if we start with session one, which was Josep, and go on from there. Thank All right, thank you. Uh, in session one, uh, we had presentation of four case studies, two mixed cultural and natural world heritage sites of religious interest and two cultural sites, one located in a remote rural area and the other in the center of the capital of the country. Three examples came from the Balkans and one came from Scandinavia. Uh, in three cases, uh, the re conservation results were good. Uh, and another with quite a few problems. All examples were European, and all religious values were related to Christianity, as you remember. Uh, so some relevant context features of these four case studies is that the, the management uh, by religious communities tends to be resilient, often more than governmental organizations which are subject to political instabilities, that uh, growing secularization creates challenges for adapting relationships between religious and political organizations, for visitor use management and heritage interpretation, among other challenging aspects. Uh, local religious communities are often not ad ad adequately involved because living religious values were often not identified during the nomination process of the sites, and governance issues were not taken into consideration in the management plans of many World Heritage Sites of Religious Interest. And uh, this, in these four examples, uh, the ownership was by the religious communities, be they religious institutions or monastic institutions. Uh, I have 10 suggestions, I think, yes. Uh, I will read them um, for the potential national strategy, which was the, the overall uh, topic of this first session. Uh, one, secure the legitimate rights of religious communities on living religious sites, ensuring the full inclusion of all relevant custodians in decision making about World Heritage Sites, including those related to higher level and national level policies. Two, 
promote integrated management for world heritage sites of religious interest, agreeing on the main objectives, and develop effective collaboration based on common language. The main objectives should include maintaining the spiritual functionality of the sites, facilitating the access and well-being of faithful and visitors, maintaining the site integrity, especially in relation with the universal outstanding values. Three, propose guidance to the managers of the World Heritage Sites of Religious Interest based on the agreed objectives involving local communities as much as possible. Four, share experience among similar sites belonging to different faiths, training religious community members responsible of heritage conservation while sensitizing heritage experts into religious matters at the same time. Five, acknowledge and secure the role of the re religious community's involvement as a key players for long-term conservation of the sites and develop proper relationships between the natural and the cultural heritage agencies and between governmental agencies and religious and local communities at all relevant levels. Six, uh, put in place mechanisms that will ensure the legitimate representation of religious communities and institutions in decision making and their advisory bodies and strengthening the cultural identity of religious communities, in particular regarding resource management and conservation. Seven, ensure government overseeing or control to warranty the preservation of World Heritage Sites of Religious Interest Integrity because religious community management does not always guarantee it. Eight, uh, is an example of the Norway national strategy that could be emulated or adapted in other countries, including the promotion of local or national NGOs for managing World Heritage Sites of Religious Interest when the governmental or the religious organizations cannot uh, cope with that. Uh, and the two last points are on another level. Uh, one is that each living religious world heritage site is constituted by a unique combination of natural, cultural, and religious or spiritual conditions and is facing distinct threats and opportunities. Hence, the generic recommendations will have to always be tailored to the particular circumstances of each site, making sure that the preservation of the, the container, the, the building structures, uh, is done in synergy with the conservation of the, the content, the religious living heritage. And last, the above recommendations could be useful beyond the World Heritage Site area, the buffer, beyond the buffer zone even, into the surrounding natural areas, which are functionally linked to the site, be they protected or conservative areas. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to, does anybody have any, I think actually what we'll do is we'll take all the present feedback and then we'll have a, a session for questions at the end until starvation drives you out of the room. Right, so Constantine. Значит, ну, по-перше, деякі моменти виступів, всього було п'ять виступів на другій сесії пленарній. Проблеми, які виказували виступаючи, певним чином збігаються з попередньою сесією. Це деяке непорозуміння між релігійною громадою, представниками державної сфери управління. Є, скажімо так, певні були пропозиції, ну, в першу чергу, зараз я їх як рекомендації скажу. І, ну, дві виступи були з України, тут відомо, є певні складнощі заємин між релігійними громадами держави, враховуючи багаторічні антирелігійну політику в ще в 20 столітті, яка не може так швидко змінитися. Вірменія, вона 
трохи як я виступаючи за Вірменію, показав більш таку позитивну картину взаємин між церквою і державою. Є певні проблеми з виступаючи з, з Грецією, назвав з Ефіопії. І е, тут я хотів би запропонувати е, так, е, невеличкі вже рекомендації, які підготовлені. Е, вони дещо збігаються з попереднім доповідачем, дещо е, інше. Е, я так уже е, їх прочитаю в тому вигляді, якому підготував. Учасники семінару закликають усі сторони, що беруть участь в управлінні об'єктами всесвітньої спадщини, релігійного призначення, які знаходяться у спільному використанні, здійснити кроки до поліпшення порозуміння в питаннях управління об'єктами. В першу чергу, необхідно укріплювати і розвивати зв'язок між визначною універсальною цінністю та асоційованими священними цінностями об'єктів релігійного призначення. Важливим кроком в цьому напрямі має стати розробка та впровадження освітніх програм, які надаватимуть всім зацікавленим особам Необхідні універсальні знання про історію, духовну і культурну цінність об'єктів всесвітньої спадщини, релігійного призначення, а також про існуючу міжнародну та національну нормативну базу про сучасні підходи до збереження пам'яток. Освітні програми мають бути розроблені на міждисциплінарному рівні з обов'язковим залученням представників богословської освіти. Так. Дякую. Thank you very much. That was very helpful and very precise and, co and concise, so, so thank you. Um, and we'll work those in to the text over lunch. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, the section refers to the governance, challenges in governance and management of the world heritage properties, a perspective of cooperation and involvement of all stakeholders, including religious communities and experts in the field of um, museumification of the world heritage properties. The study cases which were uh, presented um, all uh, uh, all over the world, not only uh, European uh, heritage, but also we have uh, uh, heritage from Ethiopia and uh, from uh, Jordania, which was very, very helpful uh, for us to understand the, the different uh, situation. Um, uh, the sites, uh, uh, the uh, studies, pre uh, case studies presenting were very different uh, in the terms of uh, the ownership of the of these sites and also in the term of the use of these sites. Not all of them are active um, religious places. It's a, a Christian heritage, of course, what we discuss um, in uh, uh, this uh, this. Um, uh, a conference, uh, but um, the challenges came from uh, the the relation uh, between the state and the owners uh, or users of of this heritage, of course. Uh, so, um, uh, regarding the management system presenting the, uh, today, we. Uh, um, may conclude that, the, of course, uh, the state is very, very important, but uh, also uh, we must talk about the involvement of the religious communities. Um, of course, for the properties which are used as uh, living religious places, but also uh, for those uh, who became museums, because with their help we may transmit the uh, cultural religious values of this heritage, even these values or the natural ones 
are not mentioned in uh, uh, outstanding universal value declaration. As um, you, uh, we also uh, only the site from Ethiopia uh, has the six criterion uh, for the inscribing, uh, inscribing on the World Heritage List. But there are sites, of course, with um, natural uh, criteria. Um, so um, we must increase the dialogue and the involvement of religious communities, even for the site which are no longer in use. And um, of course, um, in the management system, it's very important the participation of the uh, uh, um, experts in um, uh, monitoring and works of conservation and restoration. Uh, but the involvement of the local community it's, uh, and I think that it's a, a delicate program in all uh, problem in the um, case, study cases presented. Um, they must be uh, involved in management system and also in conservation and restoration works. As you may see, we have good practices. And, but we must work to, to raise the awareness of the local communities uh, regarding the values uh, that must be protected on these World Heritage uh, sites. And uh, another uh, issue uh, um, extracted from the uh, cases presenting, uh, it's uh, about the importance of the surrounding natural landscape, the wide surrounding natural uh, landscape, and also um, regarding the problem of environmental changes, uh, which uh, in most of the cases, this wide surrounding lands landscape is not included in the buffer zone, but it is really very important for maintaining uh, the, the values of these uh, sites. So uh, it's very important in the management system to involve responsible authorities and specialists in, the, uh, in uh, this, uh, this problem. For all the sites where the um, natural landscape uh, has an, an importance. And um, I think that these are my, my conclusion regarding, of course, um, the session um, where I was, um, I moderated, but uh, regarding uh, the cases presented in this um, conference. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, too. I think we're beginning to see some patterns emerging, which is helpful. We haven't come we haven't got totally different viewpoints coming out. So if we can go on to the last session, which is Manana. Thank you. <coughs> uh, <coughs> at the session uh, dedicated to, to discuss the living religious and sacred world heritage in the historical urban context, there were presented four presentations and I think very interesting and uh, diverse cases were put on our table, starting from the Holy See experience uh, on the perfect, to ensure the OUV of, of the site, whole site. Uh, the, the presenter shared with us with the restoration and monitoring approach to ensure the er at the early stage, the uh, condition, proper state of consideration, no, proper condition of these uh, World Heritage monuments and objects. So the system uh, that has been successfully established uh, in the, within this uh, site or complex uh, city uh, proves that uh, it should be the best way to develop our methodology and approaches on consideration in this way. I was very inter it was very interesting, the presentation uh, from University of uh, Chemistry. Uh, it was interesting due to the um, 
complicated management, uh, the universities under the double ministerial creation. From the other hand, it also proves the successful collaboration with the religious uh, uh, representative uh, in the region. Uh, and through this uh, partnership, uh, they have excellent results. And I think they mutually benefited because in the university, they offered the special courses for uh, religious uh, career, father, father um, popes and uh, other religious uh, uh, authorities. And, uh, and through this participation, the university uh, remains its spiritual uh, and authentic value that had uh, from the beginning. Uh, I was very excited with the presentation uh, from our colleague uh, from Cairo. Uh, the site, I think, the most complicated due to the multi-religious sites uh, located in the one plot of land. And um, so all these sites uh, are managed and uh, working are have, they have their prayers in the same time and uh, harmonious way. And I think it's in the world is the best way to, see, to show the diversity of cultures, how they could coexist with each other. Uh, what about the management of, <clears throat> of this uh, World Heritage site? Uh, it was interesting for us, the complexity of uh, the uh, manage, management system uh, or showed to us, starting from the ministries. I think it's uh, just several countries in the world have the separate Ministry of Antiquities, and uh, that means that the heritage assets are on the high level of the poli poli in the policy of government of um, of Egypt, uh, and the collaboration between the local. Uh, municipal, municipal services and uh, uh, nation, at the national level with the ministries uh, resulted the step-by-step -step development uh, of the um, quarters of the public spaces and cultural, uh, cultural um, spaces of Cairo, old Cairo. Another issue was also stressed regarding how we should conserve uh, the heritage uh, how we should remain its out, what does it mean to preserve its authenticity, uh, how, uh, and the claims from the local population to uh, stop the further development. Uh, and this discussion, I think, it's, it is not the first time when this the question is rising on the table. Uh, more and more, the question how to develop the World Heritage Sites uh, and giving the development possibilities, not to stop them, not to uh, maintain them in the antiquities or in the medieval period, how to deal with this issue, giving the possibility to, um, to cities and urban settlements to grow and to develop uh, uh, their, their, their needs and uh, to, to, to go in the, to live in the 21st century. So it was, it was a very interesting question arising on, the, um, on our discussion. Um, and I think they, they, it should, this question should be discussed further, how to deal with, uh, and I think it's also the question with the complex monuments, not just with the, uh, with the settlements and cities, but also uh, this question should be addressed to the complex monuments where uh, we have the ruins, or we have almost uh, um, almost, almost destroyed uh, heritage. How we should deal with this heritage in future to back in usage for uh, people uh, for for our generation. So, uh, and last, I would like to say I would like to repeat my uh, my issues presented uh, by me. Uh, I stressed the question related to the uh, 
to how to harmonize uh, the <clears throat> religious interests with a local population needs and at the same time to ensure the universal value of the heritage, as how to link all these points together and how to set this network to satisfy and to, um, to, to satisfy the all needs or to find, as Joseph yesterday uh, told us, to find the consensus, to reach the consensus in this way. Um, and I would like to say that I, I think the training and capacity building should be one of the most strong instruments to improve step by step the existing situation if other countries also have such circumstances as Georgia has to step by step to improve the uh, situation and to harmonize the uh, all issues in one management system. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have 15 minutes with the help of my the, the moder session moderators. You have brought us back to time. So well done. Um, who has any questions or comments? As, um, in, in making comments or asking questions, can you think particularly of points which you would want to see in the recommendations of the meeting? Thank you. Who wants to go first? Nobody ever wants to go first. Do we have no comments at all? In which case, we can go straight to lunch. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah, oh, yes, we have final words from the steering committee, of whom we have one representative. So, okay, so we will move to the final words of the steering committee. And then this afternoon, we will go through the draft recommendations, which we will finish over lunchtime. And at that point, there will be another chance for discussion and comment and so on, when you can all argue about where the commas should go. Ah, no, no you're not asking. I thought, if, no, right. Well, uh, sorry to take the, the floor again, but I'm the only member here of the steering committee of this initiative, uh, and I'd like to say some final words on behalf of the steering committee and the advisory bodies. Uh, the first is that uh, in this international seminar, we had uh, very exciting uh, presentations from 12 different countries from Europe, Africa, and the Arab regions, belonging to several Christian denominations related to numerous cultural world heritage sites and to uh, mixed cultural and natural sites, all of them having significant religious interest. The presentations have shown many good experiences and a few cases where the preservation of the outstanding universal values has not been secured. Most good experiences show examples of healthy, effective collaboration between governmental agencies, religious institutions, and local communities, be they lay or religious. The lack of the required collaboration or dialogue among the key partners was identified as part of the causes of mismanagement in some cases. However, even in the best experiences of management and governance of World Heritage Sites of religious interest, we notice room for improving the integration of natural, cultural, and spiritual values. Because existing management models of World Heritage Sites have been shaped by a historic separation 
of the organizations responsible for the leading religious heritage, the built structures, the cultural heritage, and the surrounding environment and landscape which sustains the local communities and provides the key tangible resources for the sites and often the intangible sources for inspiration. Third, hence the need for integral holistic approaches on the governance and management of World Heritage sites of religious interest has been made clear again. We should therefore encourage to find ways to overcome barriers and foster honest, effective collaboration between concerned agencies, between governmental institutions and religious communities and organizations, and between both of them and the other key right holders or stakeholders to preserve these unique, outstanding heritage sites. In this regard, I hope that the lessons learned in this seminar can fit the UNESCO guidance and the preparation. I want to stress, however, that in this seminar we had no case studies related to natural world heritage sites of religious interest. And an absence that followed the pattern of the previous meetings of this initiative. Given that the conservation trends of natural world heritage sites are negative, globally speaking, as I show in my presentation, that only 20% of the natural world heritage sites are in good status, I suggest that in the next meetings of the initiative, we correct this lack of representation from natural world heritage sites. In this regard, and this is my final point, I would like to recall that the World Heritage Committee established during the 41st session in Krakow in 2017, an International Indigenous Peoples Forum on World Heritage in order to elevate the role of indigenous communities in the identification, conservation, and management of World Heritage properties. The launch of the Indigenous Peoples Forum followed in uh, 2018 during the 42nd session of the World Heritage Committee in Bahrain. This particular network provides an example for other networks of managers of World Heritage sites of religious interest, which we hope may be created to exchange experiences and to develop positive synergies among different sites and different countries overcoming political, cultural, and religious differences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, those are very useful thoughts, which will go into the final meeting report, particularly if you send me your notes. Sure, I will. Um, and I think now we can stop for lunch. I would like to thank our moderators for uh, their excellent job and uh, uh, very important uh, contribution to our seminar. Thank you very much. And, uh, um, and now we can uh, have a lunch break. And after lunch, uh, so we have this break till, till uh, 2.40. And then uh, uh, we'll proceed to, uh, with discussion of our draft recommendations and with approval. So, bon appétit. Thank you.